Thanks, Jack and Gray. And good morning, everyone. Uh, the funny thing about this morning is Van called me early in the week, and he said, Greg, I'm getting sick, so can you stand in for me this week? And I said, fine, and then I got sick. Uh, so I have my mask on today just to spare you. I, I'm not COVID, but I'm something, and so I sound a little low today um, and have a little less energy than normal, uh, but uh, I'm glad to be able to be with you today and to celebrate this day. Um, and to be with uh, the people of God at the beginning of a new year. It's good to see a whole row of Jeroes over there uh, on the other side. So welcome. It's good to see everyone. Uh, it's good to see Sophia back from Ohio State. I think this is the first time I've seen her. Maybe I've missed her earlier. And there's other people here. It's always a bad thing to start mentioning names and then you miss someone. Uh, but it's good to see uh, everybody here. And of course, Heidi is here. Um, and so we're glad to see her, one of the Ansel girls. Uh, and so I'm so glad to see them here and glad to see many of you back. We still have, as uh, Grayson mentioned, we've got a few people sick um, that are out today. And also we have some heavy things in the background that are going on at EBC. Uh, and so many of you are praying for those. Adam May's dad is still struggling uh, in the hospital, uh, has had some improvement, but uh, he's struggling. You need to pray for Adam and his family. Um, and also... Um, Donna Hauser has been struggling, uh, need to pray for her um, in these uh, days here. Uh, and then uh, Sarah and Marty uh, Larson, Sarah's dad, Rufus, uh, is struggling with some illness. He's over in Trinity, both uh, Donna and uh, Rufus are in Trinity. Uh, and uh, um, Lee uh, D is in the hospital, that's uh, uh, Adam's dad. So for those uh, to remember uh, in prayer as we think about uh, people who are hurting at this point in time. Well, I'm going to draw your attention to a very familiar passage. I want you to turn to Psalm 23 with me for a moment. Psalm 23, then we're going to go to John chapter 10 a little bit later. Um, it was a good exercise for me uh, to write uh, reflections over this past year. I don't know if you do that or maybe you just do it mentally. Um, um, and, and I've shared it within our family and, and different places, the things to kind of summarize our, our last year. And our last year has been just a very interesting one for us as the Cowsers, especially in the fall. Uh, it's been a, a strange juxtaposition of weddings and funerals, and new beginnings and endings. Uh, and so uh, throughout those, I've done a number of funerals, I think four of them over the fall. I might be more. I, don't, I can't remember all of them now. Uh, but in each one of those occasions, there's been all kinds of things to think about, thankfully, uh, the funerals that I've done have been for people who knew Jesus, uh, which gives hope in the midst of very dark circumstances. But uh, often I will go to Psalm 23 uh, in those moments. Um, but I think it's uh, Psalm 23 is not just for endings, it's for beginnings. And I want to I think about Psalm 23 and about the portrait of God that's painted there um, for us to think a little bit about our new year ahead. You know, when, we come, when you come to the new year, we know it's on an arbitrary division. It just has, so happens that the calendar goes out. Uh, it used to be a little bit more significant when all of us had actual, you know, physical calendars, right? Because uh, you'd have to walk around through your house and you'd have to, you know, get the old calendar, throw it out, and then put the new calendar up. Well, now many of us, all it means is that our, just our mobile phone just switches over to the next year. You don't have anything to throw out. You just, you know, uh, you know, wand forward to look at what's going on. But there's a number of things that just remind us that time is passing. We celebrate it as a culture. Uh, we come, uh, come to the moment when the ball drops in New York City or the various other things that happen around the world uh, to, to remind it. We treat a year as a distinct unit of time, and we look back over, well, what are the memories of 2021 or 2020, those kinds of things. And it, it's a moment, and I think it's worthwhile for us as believers, because the scripture calls us as believers to be people who remember, who recall, uh, who take the past and bring it back into reference, into the present, to learn from it. Matter of fact, much of our reading of the Scripture is going to the past of what God has done in order to recount His character, His activity, His power, and also to give us warnings about what the kind of life is that will bring difficulty and judgment, as well as what kind of life will bring blessing. 
And so we often, as uh, these things were written, right, for our admonition as we look over the lives of the people that are here. Well, when we come to our own time, it's a time when we reflect over the old, and our society right now is reflecting over the most significant things as far as different people think from the past, and they're making predictions about the upcoming year. It's both a time to recall and appreciate the good, as well as to recall and confess the bad. Right? There's a moment to look back over the past and to celebrate the good things, but there isn't a person here, even if you know Jesus Christ, that there aren't things in the past year that you wish were not a part of your past. Things that you need to confess and things turn away for. It's also a time for renewal and change. We want to renew our commitment to what was good and right and our last year to bring it into the new. So we want to carry it forward. It's also a time to make changes, time to drop something we regret and replace it with something that's good and right. Right? That's all those resolutions. It's always, every day is a day to stop something bad and start something else. Right? It doesn't have to be at the end of the year, but every day is a day to stop something bad. Uh, one of the things I mentioned this last week is we've run into um, um, at least one individual we were talking to over these last months uh, who just felt it was too late in their life to make significant changes. And what they were talking about is their relationship to God and the way they see Him. And of course, the only time it's too late is when you're dead. Right? It's never too late. Today's a good day to make a change. And I don't care if you're 15 or 25 or 35, 45 or 95. Today's a day to make a change. So uh, it's time to, to renew and it's time to change. And then there's just a little bit of a sense. I, I was reading one person's post. They posted this little, little uh, picture there. 12 new chapters, 365 chances, right? So it's like you, you open up a book and all of a sudden it's blank and now you can write it. And this January can be a little bit of a different story in February and so forth and so on. But you know, when I think about communion, which is what we're going to celebrate here this morning, there really isn't a better time to celebrate communion than the beginning of a new year. Because this is a practice that's ordained by Christ and calls us to go back and remember some really, really important things because we don't know what the new year holds, right? A lot of people are predicting what's going to happen, but they don't know any more than any one of us know what's going to happen in the new year. Uh, we don't know if this next year is going to be the best year health-wise we've ever known or the most challenging year that we've ever known. We don't know if financially it's going to be a good year or a difficult year. We don't know if, if uh, uh, some of the things that we're worried about in our culture are going to shift or they're going to get darker. We don't know. We don't know uh, any of those events. But what we do know is that God is the same, that his purposes are the same, that who we are is his people, and that we have a mission that remains the same no matter what the circumstances are. And when we come to the communion, it takes us back into the act of God in Christ that reminds us of who we are, our identity. It reminds us of who we used to be and who we've become because of what Christ's done. It also reminds us that we can't fix ourselves, as Grayson was reminded us as we sing, we can't fix ourselves. The reason that we're made new is because God did something for us that we couldn't do for ourselves. And the only way we're going to continue to live into that newness is by dependence on him and walking with him. And so it reminds us we need outside intervention for everything that matters in life. And it reminds us that we were people at one time that were as worst off as you could be. We were under God's wrath and judgment, and now we're people who have are more loved than we can ever imagine. So it tells us a lot of stuff about ourselves, the important things that we need to carry forward. It even gives us the right attitude toward the future. Right? Um, um, as you transition through life, uh, every stage of life has its kind of sweetness about it. Um, you know, I remember as a parent enjoying, as I was reminded this this morning, we had little Lachlan, the youngest of Jack and Gray's in there, and Lachlan's just a two-year-old, and so he still speaks like a two-year-old, and we enjoy hearing a two-year-old speak. Uh, but we, and it will be sad when he stops speaking like a two-year-old, but we will be nonetheless very happy that he doesn't speak like a two-year-old for his whole life, right? We want him to grow up, but there's a sweetness about him being a two-year-old that when it passes, there's a little bit of sweet sorrow when that's over. 
right? We feel the passage of time and that happens. And you transition over time to move to when my girls were in the home and you could have a conversation with them, which made them more interesting to me. I could have a conversation with them. And as they grew up and become adults, you transition over and over again. And as stages come and go, there's a little bit of sadness at each stage that you miss the sweetness of what passed in the times before. But as you transition, what you need is some stable ground to keep you on track so that you don't attach your happiness to any particular set of circumstances. Because one thing that we do know is things are going to change. Mom, your kids are going to grow up, and they should. You're going to get older. It's inevitable. Things will not always be the same. People that you love, and this is something that we've experienced in my family here, people that you love will die and no longer be a part of your life. Things will change in your health picture, right? Well, what's going to be your anchor and what's going to guide you as you walk through those transitions? Well, we're just in one, and now we want to come back to some truths from God's Word that help us to make sure that we set our feet on good, firm foundation as we face what the new year will bring to us, okay? And there's one thing here, I was quoting this in in the back here earlier, J.I. Packer, who's a famous theologian, you know, for us as a Christian, the communion lets us look toward the future, not with dread, but with anticipation, right? Do you remember, we're going to say this at the end of the communion, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, right? So for the Christian, The best is always yet to come, right? So you haven't lived your glory days, and now you're watching from a distance as your glory days are already. Your glory days as a follower of Jesus are yet to come, right? The best is yet to come, right? So come to Psalm 23, and I want you to read it with me. I'm going to ask you to stand as we read Psalm 23. I'm reading from the NIV. And we're going to look at the kind of standard if we're going to evaluate our past, which as Christians, we need to be people who reflect, right? Reflective people, evaluate our past. What's the standard that we use? And as we look toward the future, what informs our aspirations or where we're going, right? What should we be heading toward? Let's read Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. May the Lord add his blessing, the reading of his word. You may be seated. I just want to say at the beginning here, uh, the metaphor that the author begins with is the metaphor of a shepherd and sheep. And I just want to suggest to you that the reader sees himself as a sheep. And God is the shepherd. And uh, this is the metaphor, of course, as we're going to look in John chapter 10, that Jesus is going to pick up when he talks about himself as being the good shepherd over his sheep, right? And so Jesus as the shepherd, but then it's going to move into another image of God, of this, uh, of this uh, king, of this powerful divine figure who's going to invite his people into this lavish banquet and treat them as honored guests, right? So I have these two images that he's going to deal with here. So Psalm 23 is a song of joyful trust in the provision of God. God is celebrated as the good shepherd king. The loving presence of the Lord and the rich provision that, me- that means encompasses all of David's life, right? The psalm begins and ends with references to the Lord. If you notice this, the Lord is my shepherd. Notice how it ends. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The very center of the psalm celebrates his presence, right? Look at chapter, look at verse 4, right here at the end of verse 4. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. 
David constructs the psalm to emphasize that God is the beginning, middle, and end of a life of blessing. But it's because of who the shepherd is that he is the Lord, right? So it's because of the character of the shepherd that he trusts that the shepherd is his true provision, right? And notice what it says here, right, in the middle of the psalm in verse 3. Notice what it is that motivates God's activity, his activity to bless, right, to make provision for. He guides me along, verse 3, the right paths for his name's sake, right? So God is the center of everything. He does it for his name's sake. It's his character that makes him do what he does, to move toward rebellious, broken, wandering, hapless, right, goofy sheep, right? He moves toward us not because we deserve it, not because we warrant that kind of treatment, because this is the character of the shepherd. He loves the sheep. He pursues them. This is what drives his actions. And then when we look at his actions, it points back to his character, right? So you see who he is by what he does. It is the Lord, the good and loving Lord, that is worthy of adoration and trusting obedience. David declares that the Lord's good and loving character drives him toward us. The shepherd king actively cares for, guides, and protects those under his care, right? If you were studying this, I'd encourage you to to underline that almost all the actions in this little psalm are done by the Lord. Think about these phrases. He makes me lie down. He leads me. He restores my soul. He guides me. You prepare a table. You anoint, right? So this is this shepherd king, this anointed king who's moving toward us, right, to give us a place to lie down. The imagery here, of course, is to have the sheep come to lush pastures, pastures where they can sit down and be refreshed, where they're sitting alongside fresh water that they can drink, right, and so that they can be refreshed by the provision that the shepherd provides. He guides them in safe places, right, He makes provision for their blessing, right? Sometimes as you walk through life and life is so difficult and hard and you're facing difficult circumstances, this vision of a God who is positively moving toward you for your blessing can get lost sight of. God, are you here? Are you good? It's hard to see that. I'm your shepherd. You can trust me to walk through this dark valley. So he drives us toward, but notice where his actions take us right? Look at these. He makes me to lie down where? In green pastures, in lush pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the right paths, right? The right paths to keep me out of danger and also to bring me into blessing. He prepares a table in the presence of his enemies. This, this imagery is here is the, the shepherd king, the powerful one, right in the presence of our enemies, showing favor to us to declare to us, they belong to me, you touch them, you mess with me. You touch them, you mess with me. These are mine. And he anoints them with oil. He treats them with honor and blessing. So David understood that the flourishing God offered and provided did not mean a life, though, free from suffering and opposition, right? Notice he does it in the presence of the enemies, right? So whatever we know about the present, we know that God is a good shepherd. He's going to make provision for us in every way, but he's going to do it in the face of our enemies until one day he removes the enemies altogether. And the enemies may be relational issues, they may be financial issues, they may be spiritual struggles that you're wrestling with, maybe mental illness, maybe the lostness of one of your family members. Right? All those things that are threatening your well-being, that are drawing your heart into them, that are bringing tears out of your eyes, that are putting you on your knees for their benefit, right? God provides for us in the face of all of those types of moments and struggles. So there's no, circumsp- there's no place, there's no circumstance where the Lord is not with those who put their trust in Him, Right? I do think, and as we come to the book of James at the beginning of this year, I think that when we get into trouble, there's two questions that we often ask. Ron and I yesterday were sitting in a hospital room uh, with a young mom uh, that circumstances look really, really dark. 
uh, apart from what appears to be a miracle, she's not going to come out of that hospital bed. And she's a young mom with, with elementary age boys. And when you're sitting in a moment like that, is God good? Comes to your mind. Is God good? Or if you feel in the moment you don't doubt his goodness, God, are you there? Do you see me, God? Do you see what I'm suffering with? God, are you there? And as you look through the Old Testament prophets in particular, they're often challenging whether God is good or whether God sees what's going on. But for here, David wants to make, there's no time or occasion when the Lord's soul-satisfying provision is unavailable or insufficient for those who put their trust in him. And there is nothing that can ultimately threaten or take away God's good and loving presence with all that that means. God's love and goodness always actively pursue David and will dwell with him forever, right? What's often hidden here in verse 6, surely your goodness and love will follow me, uh, that may connote an image to some people like, you know, your, your best, your, your dog at home, right? Uh, that everywhere you go, that's where you even get the, friends, the, the expression, I feel dogged, right? Uh, the, everywhere I go, the dog is right behind me, like he's following me and I can't get rid of it. No, the, the, the imagery here is personifying God's goodness and love as something that is actively pursuing David, right? So it's, it's a picture of God actively pursuing his people to bring his love and goodness to bear on them day in and day out. And so David is secure in God's presence that's always there and that's actively seeking his best, right? And this is one of the things, one of the wisdom, pieces of wisdom that comes to us in the midst of the darkest times. Is God there? Is he good? Yes. Is he there? Yes. Well, what is he up to? I know he's trying to do something for my good and his glory. I know that. I know that's his intentions. So I know his intentions. I also know what the ultimate outcome is. I know that everything that, I, that threatens me has been vanquished and everything that I long for is going to be realized. So whatever's happening right now is not going to take from me the things that really matter. Whatever's happening right now is not just out of God's control, but God is there at work and he wants to draw me deeper into a relationship with him. He wants to situate me in a particular way within the lives of the people around me to be a powerful voice for God's wisdom and truth, right? He wants me to use my platform of suffering to declare his goodness. That's what I know. And there's nothing that happens that's senseless or outside of God's control. God's love and goodness drive all of God's dealings with David. Only that which is ultimately for David's good and for God's glory will follow David all the days of his life. God doesn't waste suffering. He doesn't bring it into our lives in an arbitrary way. God is actively working so that his mercy and his goodness will follow us all the days. So, some questions here. Do you hunger for purpose and meaning? If you follow him, he will take you to the truth that will answer the whys of life. Are you looking for direction for your life? If you follow him, he will take you down the path of flourishing. He knows what you were made for. Are you walking in the shadow lands of death? If you follow him, he will protect you. He is the Lord of the shadow lands. Are you being attacked by enemies? If you follow him, he will protect you. He will root you in reality and his provision so that you can face and overcome your fears. Are you looking for affirmation? If you follow him, you will know real belonging. Are you looking for healing, for deep healing from guilt, from rejection, from betrayal, from abuse, from loss? He can restore and bring life to your soul. So when we come to the Lord's table, we come to commemorate the life and work of Christ. This is a commemoration of where God in the person and work of Christ by the enabling spirit most fully manifested his character as Savior King. And I want you to look to John chapter 10 with me for a moment. So Jesus embodies in his life and his actions everything that David knew in a preparatory way in the Old Testament Jesus came to fully fulfill. Who is the shepherd who's going to truly lead us into the path of righteousness? The one that's going to truly satisfy our deepest needs of our soul. Who is going to make provision for that? Well, that's Jesus. And he wants us to know that. And he picks up this metaphor in John chapter 10 and wants us to get the connection between the two. 
So look at verse 7 with me here. Therefore Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen, and I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. So here we find in and through the work of Christ done according to the Father's will and made effective by the Spirit, when we put our trust in Christ, that the goodness and love are experienced that we read about in Psalm 23. If you don't know Jesus today, the Scriptures are saying, God is saying to us, then you don't have His goodness and His mercy pursuing you. If you know Jesus today, His goodness and mercy have pursued you all the way to the cross and from the cross through an empty tomb and provide provision for you for everything that you long for yet to come by putting your trust in the good shepherd because he laid his life down for his sheep and he's taken it back up again to assert his authority over death and to conquer everything that truly threatens us and he's come that we might have life and have it to the full. The kind of life that Jesus offers, the kind of provision comes through belief in him. So Jesus, the shepherd king, opened the door to genuine life for David, for us, and for any yet to believe. He willingly laid down his life for his sheep, though a rebellious, self-centered, hateful lot we were. To follow him is to find the deep satisfaction we crave. To follow him is to find the protection from all there is truly to fear. To follow him is rich provision indeed. This is something by faith that we want to pray for one another over this coming year. You know, one thing that I know that's a resolution that God wants us all to follow in this coming year is follow Jesus. Resolve to follow Jesus, right? To believe in Him, to trust in Him. You're going to have lots of other voices that are going to try to tell you what matters, about which direction to go, about how your life is really significant. And you're going to go back and you're going to say, no, I want to follow Jesus. Jesus. As you face difficulties, the only way to get through them is to follow Jesus. As you have successes, the only way not to let them go to your head is to follow Jesus. How's your marriage going to get richer and deeper and hang together? It's not because you two are such a great couple. It's going to happen because you follow Jesus and you love him. Right? And because you love him, you're going to keep pushing toward that other broken person despite the fact that they don't deserve it. Because you've been loved undeservedly and you've been empowered by Christ and you're not sustained primarily by their love. You're sustained by your commitment to Jesus. What's going to make a life that you look back on without regret? Follow Jesus. Right? How are you going to to get through the relational brokenness in your family? Follow Jesus. But Greg, Jesus tells me to forgive the people who've hurt me. Yep. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. You know, I wrote down lessons for myself over this last year. And one of the lessons that stuck out to me over my last year is the darkness and sadness that comes from bitterness.
One of the things that often happens around the holidays is you get back together with your family. And anytime you're around anybody's family for a, a, a length of time, there's always a bunch of stories in the room, right? Some stories in the room. And sometimes when we get together as families, we mask them all because we, own, we know we're only going to be with them a short period of time. Uh, and there's not time to unpack things and talk about things. But everybody who's aware recognizes that everybody's just walking in with this big bag of stuff that's in there. And sometimes there's broken relationships that you just can't go there anymore. And so you just deal with things on the surface. There's anger and hurt. Boy, what healing comes when somebody walks up to someone and says, you know, I know I hurt you. Would you forgive me? What happens uh, as I talk with someone, I mentioned this before, who wrestled with bitterness in her life and recently was able to let it go. And her response was, I only wish I had done it earlier. None of us who've lived any length of time uh, are going to have a life that's free from other people hurting us and us hurting other people. It, it's, it's a time to follow Jesus back into broken relationships. And it starts with, Jesus, please change my heart so that I give up my right to revenge and I have your heart for them so that, Lord, I long for them what you long for them. Lord, give me your heart for this people because, Lord, I have to be honest with you. I don't want their best. I don't want even to see them. And it begins there. So how are we going to go after that? We need to follow Jesus. We need to follow Jesus. The addictions, the darkness that you struggle with, what do you need to do this year? Follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. Jesus is the only one that can provide for you the life. He's the only one that can replace what is owning you with something better. You need to follow him. Jesus is the good shepherd. He's the good shepherd. Do you believe that you can trust him in your marriage? You can trust him as an employee. You can trust him as a son or a daughter. You can trust him as a student at school. You need to follow him. To follow Jesus is to find life. He'll take you in the right paths. He'll walk through the dark moments. He'll take you through the difficult places. And ultimately, he will take us to the goal for which he saved us. You know, when you think about that opening uh, of the Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Now think about that for a moment. I know I've said this to you before. We as Christians, we don't need anything, right? Right? Uh, most of you just got a bunch more junk for Christmas, didn't you? Right? Uh, and you're still a little bit depressed about all the junk you already have. So where are you going to put the new junk that you have um, as you do that? Uh, in America, we have an overabundance of stuff. That's why we have so many storage facilities, right, for us to take our overage of stuff and stick it into other people's storage where we never see it there. Uh, and we get, we, get, we get burdened by all the stuff that we have. And the thing that we know is that Whatever we have, it will never ultimately satisfy us. And then next year we'll get something else and we'll eventually throw it out or we'll try to make our junk somebody else's burden by selling it to them, right? Or by giving it away or to do one of those kind of things like that. But we have those kinds of moments and that kind of feeds the kind of notion if we lose the sense of what the gift giving is about, it kind of feeds the notion is that if I just had a little bit more, if I just had this right thing, if I just had this set of circumstances, then I could be happy. And the psalmist comes back and says, you are already incalculably rich. What you need is not anything more. You just need a deeper appreciation of what you already have. You don't need, and think about this deeply with me, you don't need a better wife. You have everything that you need. But if your wife is not living in a way that's honoring Christ, she needs Jesus, and you need to love her as Jesus, even if she doesn't deserve it. You don't need a better job. You just need a deeper connection with Jesus, a deeper sense of the goodness that he's already given you so that you can live unto him in the midst of a difficult situation. Because you have everything that you need. This is not to convict us. This is to encourage us, 
right? I'm not without resources. I don't need my wife to change her behavior. I don't need my employer to behave differently. I don't need my kids to treat me differently. I don't need my neighbors to view me differently. I have everything that I need in Christ. And what I want to is get so far inside of that that it just kind of spills out of me, right? He fills my cup and it just kind of boils over. And I want to bring other people into that joy. And when, I, when, they, when they treat me in a way that's dishonoring, when they disrespect me, when they don't uh, love me in the ways that they should as a human being, I just feel sad for them. I don't go and excuse my behavior based on the fact that I wasn't treated right. No, I, I feel sad for them that we can't have the kind of relationship that God wants us to have. Now, I'm saying something that's easy to say but hard to live, right? Because we often... Right? I had to confess on the way here. Right? It's amazing how much I've confessed on that ride from Xenia, uh, from my house to this church. And every time I get ready to come here and speak, uh, I work through and I ask the Lord to, to, to enable me to speak today and say what I need to say, help people to not be distracted or uh, the evil one to do the work that he wants to do, but to hear what God uh, wants us to hear this morning. And as I do that, I clean my heart before the Lord. And one of the things that, that uh, I did this past week, and my wife knows it, is I joked as I even came in this morning, I think I told Phil Gilhood that uh, we had, my wife had two weeks of break and I have three and I considered this week uh, her week of break and next week my week of break. And the reason why I said that is because I, I did a lot of projects for my wife this week, right? So I'm waiting for my week of break to come over. But I wasn't a happy, helpful husband. I was a grousing, grumbling, honeydew lister, right? Uh, and I got convicted by that. I got convicted by it when I was around her, uh, and because I didn't, it wasn't my wife that was determining whether my heart was right or not, that was me, right? It wasn't my parents, it wasn't anyone else around me, it was me deciding that. And I was, I was suggesting that if my wife would behave differently, then I could be happier this week. And really, I had everything that I needed, I needed to love and bless my wife with what I had and quit being a grumbling, grousing, honeydew guy, right? And those are the kind of things that I think about in terms of our lives. What we need as a church, we don't need a new program. We don't need any particular facility. We need a group of people who love Jesus and follow Jesus. Love Jesus and follow Jesus. And he will fill you up and spill you out on people. And when you're full, right, you don't need anything else to fill it. Because when you get fooled by, filled by the blessings of God, you just want to spill it out on other people. When other people don't want it, you just feel sad for them. And so I want to know the shepherd king that is filling me, right? So I lack nothing. You believe that? You don't lack anything because you are incalculably wealthy. Incalculably wealthy. Well, we're going to come to the table to celebrate and we're going to reflect over those moments when God proved his love in the most dramatic way possible. When he came, right, we celebrated at Christmas time when Christ came, took on the form of a man, became obedient to the Father, obedient even to the point of death and even the kind of death that happens on a cross. This is how much you're loved. This is the love that you have. And if there isn't one person in your life who loves you, you are loved truly, deeply, permanently, forever. And you can love from a place of being rejected because the one who knows you best loves you most. You are loved. And this is the measure of his love. How, how much does he love you? Cross deep. How much does he love you? Death on a cross, love. Famous verse in Romans 5, some people might die for a good person. They might die for a righteous person. But who on earth is going to die for an ungodly sinner? But God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You are not alone. You are not abandoned. You don't have to have the people in your life love you the way you would wish you have everything that you need in Christ and what we need is a deeper appreciation of what we have. We don't need America to rise up and honor Christians. We just need to know that we're already deeply honored, we're called, and we need to love people. That's who we are as the people of God. We need to follow Jesus. 
into our new year. All right? Grayson and Jack, will you come? Uh, I want to lead us in a time before we come to our, our uh, communion celebration. A little a time of reflection of your own, right? Um, le- le- one of the other lessons that uh, I learned from this past year is really how much energy people will put into avoiding repentance, right? And sometimes we think that the, 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 the worst thing to do is to say, I'm sorry, one of the sweetest events that happened for us as elders this year, and when Steve talked about it, was a person from the past at EBC that with broken hearts, after a lot of, lot of work and effort, that we disciplined with broken hearts and tears in our eyes and hours and hours of pleading. Well, that person came back and God has restored them and they ask for forgiveness, and we just all cried together in the elder's office. We just cried together. We were so grateful for what God has done. That is God's goodness and mercy following that man all of his life. And it brought him to repentance. God's goodness and mercy is pursuing you, and some of us in here are running because we don't want to own what we've done. We don't want to repent of what we've done. We think to own it is is the scariest thing. And what's happening is that thing that you're refusing to own is killing you. And the thing that freedom lies is to say, God, I screwed up. God, I did this. I've run from you and I've thought that somebody else could lead me and I've run from you and what I just need to do is admit it and just come before you and just confess it to be true and God, would you change me, right? Don't put any more energy into running away. His goodness and mercy is following you. Don't try to outrun it. Don't try to outrun it. So I'm gonna give you a couple moments as we just bow and Grayson and Jack are gonna play here. And ask the Lord, Psalm 139, Lord, seek me, try me, search me, see if there's anything within me that that stands between me and you, and Lord, lead me in the path of righteousness. So pray that, spend some time before the Lord, and then in a moment we'll begin.